Hey everybody, this is Dr. Dale Guffey, and this is the video overview for Chapter 5, Nature and Classes of Contracts. With this chapter, we're leaving behind the first section of the text, which was more of a general overview of legal principles, and we're moving into our second section, which deals with contracts. This will encompass Chapters 5 all the way through 13. Chapter 5 is just a overview chapter. It's giving you the basic framework of how contracts work under our system. As such, we're trying really to accomplish three things here. Figure out the requirements for a valid contract, talk about types of contracts and how they're different from agreements, and then explain the difference between a contract and a quasi-contract. This is a chapter that's heavy on terminology, so take your time, go through it carefully, and I really recommend in all your chapters going forward that you're looking at that preview case on the first page of the chapter. That gets you thinking about the overarching concepts covered in the chapter, and it has the benefit of having a, a revisited preview case or the answer to the preview case at the end of the chapter. So you can kind of see how you think the case should turn out and then see how it did turn out and the court's reasoning for that. It can come in really handy. So as we go into this, let's begin with the requirements for a contract. In order for there to be a contract, what you need are five things. Now, each of these will be discussed in greater detail in later chapters, but just so you understand what they are, the very first thing you need is a mutual agreement by two or more parties either to do something or to not do something. And, and all of this gets covered in more detail later on. This contract has to be made by parties who are competent in order for them to enter into a contract that would be enforceable against both parties. We're not going to hold people who are incompetent to agreements that they made when they may not have understood what they were getting themselves into. Then the promise or the obligation under the contract of each side has to be supported by what's called consideration. Money is probably the most common form of consideration. Delivery of property or of goods is also consideration. Promise to do something or to keep from doing something that is legal can also be consideration. But without consideration, you do not have a contract. The contract has to be formed for a lawful purpose, okay? You cannot have a legal contract to do an illegal thing. That's pretty self-explanatory, I think. And then the last thing, and this only applies in some cases, but in some cases, contracts have to meet certain formal requirements. Some contracts have to be in writing. Most do not. Some contracts have to be under seal, and we'll talk about what that means as we go a little more into things. For now, let's look at these in a little more detail here, okay? Because, see if this makes sense. All contracts are agreements. Not all agreements are contracts, okay? Contracts are agreements. Contracts are binding. Agreements aren't necessarily contracts, and sometimes they're not bonding. The book gives you a good example in there. If you and a friend agree to meet at a restaurant at 6 o'clock and your friend doesn't show up, that might make them a bad friend, but you can't take them to court over it. It was a social agreement, not a contract. Okay? Okay. For classification of contracts, you have legal enforceable contracts, you have void agreements, you have void a bull agreements or contracts. We need to discuss exp express versus implied, we need to talk about formal versus simple, and we need to talk about executory 
and executed. All right. One more classification that we'll discuss is unilateral and bilateral. So let's get into this. All right. All right. Contracts, void agreements, and voidable contracts. If a contract, and I'm putting that in air quotes, is void, it has no legal effect. None at all. Now, an unenforceable contract is an agreement that isn't currently binding, but could be fixed. For example, if the law requires that a contract has to be in a certain form, such as a deed to real property must be in writing. If it's not in that form, it's unenforceable until that defect is fixed and the contract is put in writing, in our example. A void contract, on the other hand, just has no legal effect whatsoever, and it can't be cured. It cannot be fixed. A voidable contract is an enforceable agreement that can be set aside by one party. We see this a lot with minors. Contracts where an adult enters into a legally enforceable contract with a minor, it's void a bull. The minor, in almost every instance, and we'll talk about this more in, a, in more detail in a later chapter, the minor can have the contract set aside and can say, I didn't know any better, save me from my own youth. And they can have that agreement set aside. When we get into this more, you'll hear me discuss sword versus shield and how the law is used in this particular instance. Promise we'll come back to that, okay? Now, you also have both express contracts and implied contracts. Express contract, those are what you usually think of as contracts. The terms have been specified in words. It might be written, it might be an oral contract, but the two parties have expressed in words what they intend to do. An implied contract, the contract terms are implied by the conduct of the parties. One of my favorite examples of this is if you pump your if you pump gas and you then go inside to pay for it, your conduct by pumping the gas into the tank implies that you're going to pay for the gas. Of course, nowadays, most times you have to pay ahead of time because there were so many people who didn't pay. But it's an example of the terms being implied by the conduct, okay? Which it comes up more than you might think it does. There's some interesting cases in your text that are dealing with that. From there, we go into what are called formal versus simple contracts. Formal contracts have a special form or manner of creation. Um, they talk about seals, recognizances, and negotiable instruments. For negotiable instruments, think of a check. In order for a check to be valid, it really does have to have a certain form to it, a certain written form. The dollar amount has to be both in numbers and also written out, that kind of thing. It has to be signed. The seal is what most people get tangled up in when it comes to formal contracts. Almost all contracts that you have signed, even if you don't realize it, where you signed in parentheses by the signature had the word seal, sometimes LS for uh, the Latin term for under seal. The reason seals matter is in some states, North Carolina is one, for example, you have a longer statute of limitations to bring an action for breach of contract if the contract was made, quote, under seal, okay? However, almost all contracts are simple contracts. They, they don't have a particular form that they have to be in in order to be valid. Generally speaking, simple contracts, also called informal contracts, can be in writing, they can be oral, they can be implied from the conduct of the parties. When a contract has not yet been fully carried out, we say that it is executory. 
when a contract has been fully performed, all the terms have been done, it's called executed. The law has terms that sound very similar, executory and executed. Make sure you understand the distinction there. And then something that really gets people all tore up sometimes, so let's slow down, unilateral and bilateral contracts. Okay, think of it this way. Contracts refer to promises. If it's a unilateral contract, only one side makes a promise. Una meaning one. One side makes a promise, the other side fulfills the contract through an action. Not a promise, but an action. The example in your book is a good one. Smith loses her dog and offers to pay $100 to anyone who returns the dog. Jones sees the reward offer, finds the dog, and returns it to Smith. Smith made a promise to pay the reward to anybody who returned the dog. Jones doesn't promise to bring the dog back. Jones performs by actually bringing the dog back. So unilateral. Most contracts, to be honest with you, are bilateral. Bi meaning two, you have promises on both sides. If Brown offers to, or promises to sell a truck to Adams for $5,000, Adams agrees to pay $5,000, the two parties have exchanged a promise for a promise, it's a bilateral contract. And honestly, most contracts are bilateral because the law has made it very clear bilateral contracts are formed when the performance is started. Unilateral performance has to be completed. And if that's not confusing enough, again, slow down and go through this twice if you need to, you have what's called quasi-contract. Now, quasi-contract isn't even a contract, okay? This has to do with ethics, which is why we talk about that in the first part of the class. These are rights and obligations imposed by law without a real, air quotes, contract between the two parties. The two parties do not have to agree. The reason we have quasi-contract is due to fairness. I like the example they use in the textbook. If your rent is $300 a month to begin with, I'd like to know where you live, but if your rent is $300 a month and you accidentally pay the landlord $400, the landlord, if we allowed the landlord to keep that extra 100 that would be what the law refers to as an unjust enrichment. It's not fair. The law does not like quasi-contract. It really prefers things to be clearer than quasi-contract often is, but quasi-contract is a matter of fairness and of equity. It's unfair for one person to benefit at the expense of another, so courts will infer a contract in order to maintain equity, okay? Like I said, there's a lot in here, so go through it carefully, and then in the next chapter, we'll get into that first element of offer and acceptance of having both sides have mutual agreement. And until then, I'm Dr. Guffey, and this is Business Law One. Thanks.